All right, so get this. Okay. You know how siblings from the same parents can look so different? Mm. That's meiosis in action. Right. It's this uh, incredible cellular dance that shuffles genes like a deck of cards. Yeah, oh, wow. Making sure each sperm and egg cell gets a totally unique hand. Yeah. Today, mm -hmm. we are taking a deep dive into meiosis using uh, meiosis by Mr. Chi as our guide right. to figure out how this whole process works. And it's important because, you know, it's not just about why you and your siblings might have different eye colors or heights. Yes. It's this uh, mixing and matching of genes is actually essential for the survival of species. Whoa, okay. So big picture stuff right off the bat. Yeah. So where does it all begin? Well... Our source material mentions uh, something called DNA replication as a crucial first step. Right. So think of it like this. Oh. Before you can split a deck of cards in half and still have a full set in each hand, mm -hmm. you need to duplicate all the cards first, right? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So that's essentially what DNA replication does. It's like hitting copy on all your genetic material before the cell even thinks about dividing. Okay. This ensures that each new cell gets a complete set of instructions. Okay, so we're doubling the DNA. Yes. But uh, what exactly are we doubling? Yeah. Can we refresh our memories on some key terms? Of course. Chromosomes, chromatids, centromeres? Yeah. Help me out here. Okay, so imagine a chromosome, like a single long thread. Mm -hmm. That's your DNA. Okay. After replication, it's like that thread gets copied. Mm -hmm. So now you have two identical threads side by side. Okay. These are called sister chromatids. Okay. They're joined together at a point in the middle, kind of like a pair of headphones is connected. Okay. That's your centromere. Ah, okay. I'm picturing it now. Okay. So the chromosome is like a single thread. Right. And then it replicates to become two identical threads held together at the middle. Yes. Those two threads are chromatids. Uh-huh. And the point where they're attached is the centromere. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our double DNA all organized into chromosomes and chromatids. Right. What happens next? Well, this is this when the real shuffling begins. You bet. This is where we dive into the two main acts of meiosis, mm -hmm. meiosis 1 okay. and meiosis 2. Okay. Meiosis 1 is all about separating the pairs of chromosomes you got from your parents. Okay. And it all starts with a phase called prophase 1. Okay, prophase 1, hit me with it. Okay, picture this. Okay. You've got these pairs of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad. Mm -hmm. They're called homologous chromosomes. Okay. Think of them like matching pairs of shoes. Okay. They carry information about the same traits, but they're not identical. Right. Maybe one shoe from your mom is a bit flashier, while the other one from your dad is more practical. Okay, I'm with you. Okay. So what do these homologous chromosomes do in prophase one? Well, they get up close and personal. Uh-huh. They actually swap segments of DNA in a process called crossing over. Hmm. Imagine the shoes we were talking about. Yeah. Suddenly they start exchanging laces and buckles. Whoa, hold on. They're actually swapping pieces of their DNA. They are. That's wild. It is. Okay. These exchanges happen at points called chiasmata. Okay. Think of them like the little clasps where the shoes are swapping parts. Right. This crossing over is one of the major reasons why siblings can inherit such different combinations of traits. Okay. It's like shuffling the genetic decks from mom and dad, mm -hmm. creating brand new hands. So we're already mixing things up in Prophase 1. We are. This is just the beginning, and it's already mind-blowing. Yes. What happens next in this cellular dance? Next up is Metaphase 1. Okay. Where those homologous chromosome pairs, mm -hmm. all swapped and shuffled, mm -hmm. line up in the middle of the cell. Okay. And get this. Okay. The way they line up, mm -hmm. whether mom's chromosome is on the left or dad's is on the right, is totally random. Hey, seriously? Yeah. So it's like flipping a coin for each pair? It is. Heads mom's on the left, tails dad's on the left. You got it. Wow. And with 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans, well, the number of possible combinations is astronomical. Yeah. This random alignment adds a whole other layer of genetic mixing. So first we had crossing over, mixing up genes within the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And now we've got this random alignment shuffling whole chromosomes. You got it. Meiosis is really committed to creating unique combinations. It is. What happens once these randomly aligned chromosomes are all lined up? Then comes anaphase one, the big separation. Oh, okay. These homologous pairs, they've exchanged genes, they've lined up randomly, and now they finally part ways. Wow. One chromosome from each pair gets pulled to opposite sides of the cell. So we've gone from having a full set of chromosomes from both mom and dad. Right. 
to now having two separate sets, each with just one chromosome from each pair. Uh-huh. It's like we're having the genetic material. Exactly. Each new cell has a single set of chromosomes. Oh, wow. We call this a haploid set. Oh, okay. Half from mom, half from dad, but all mixed up thanks to the crossing over and random alignment. This is incredible. So much is happening in just this one stage of meiosis. It is. We're not done yet. No, we're not. Finally, we reach telophase one. Yes. It's like the cell takes a breath. Okay. The nuclear membrane reforms around each set of chromosomes, uh-huh. and the cytoplasm divides. Right. We end up with two daughter cells. Yes. Each with half the number of chromosomes we started with. That's right. Okay. So telophase one is like the curtain closing on act one of meiosis. Okay. We've gone from one cell with a full set of chromosomes from both parents to two cells each with a unique haploid set. That's a great summary. And in meiosis two, we'll see what happens to those sister chromatids. Yes. Those identical copies that are still attached to the centromere. Right. Ooh, so there's more shuffling and dividing to come. There is. Can't wait to see how this all plays out. (laughs) You won't believe what happens next. All right, so we've made it through meiosis. We have. Our starting cell has split into two daughter cells, each with its own unique mix of chromosomes. Thanks to all that shuffling we talked about. Yeah. But what happens next in meiosis the second? Oh. We still have those sister chromatids. Right. Those identical copies hanging out together. That's right. Meiosis the second is all about separating those sister chromatids. Okay. Remember our shoe analogy? It's yeah. like we've separated the pairs of shoes, huh? but each shoe still has its matching duplicate attached. Okay. In meiosis the second, we're going to split those apart creating individual shoes ready to be paired up in new and exciting ways. Okay, I'm visualizing it yeah. from pairs of shoes to individual shoes, each one unique. Yes. How does that separation actually happen? Well, think of meiosis the second as a quick replay of mitosis. Okay. The cell division process, you might remember from high school biology. Right. It goes through similar stages. Okay. Prophase two, metaphase the second, anaphase the second, and telophase two. So it's like meiosis the second is saying, hey, mitosis, you did such a great job separating chromosomes. Uh Can you do it again for these sister chromatids? Exactly. Okay. In prophase two, the nuclear membrane breaks down again. Mm -hmm. And those spindle fibers, think of them as tiny little ropes. Okay. Start forming. Okay. Then in metaphase two, the chromosomes line up single file down the middle of the cell ready for action. Okay. So they're all lined up attached at the centromere, those little clasps. Right. Then what? Then in anaphase two that, the dramatic climax, the centromere split. Wow. Those tiny ropes pull the sister chromatids apart dragging them to opposite ends of the cell. Uh It's a microscopic tug of war, and the chromatids are the prize. Wow. So we've gone from paired chromosomes to single chromosomes. Right. And now finally to individual chromatids. You got it. It's like meiosis is constantly dividing and separating, ensuring that each final cell gets a unique set of instructions. You're getting it. And lastly, we have telophase two. Okay. The nuclear membranes reform around those separated chromatids. The cytoplasm divides and ta-da. We end up with four daughter cells. Four daughter cells, each with a single set of chromosomes. And each completely unique, thanks to all that mixing and matching in meiosis. Right. That's incredible. It is. Now, you mentioned that you learned about mitosis in high school. Yeah. Do you remember the main difference between the cells produced by mitosis versus meiosis? Let me think. Mitosis creates identical copies of the original cell, Mm -hmm. right? like a copy machine churning out duplicates. Yes. But meiosis produces these unique cells, each with half the number of chromosomes. You nailed it. Mitosis is for growth and repair. Right. Making identical copies, meiosis is for creating those special gametes, the sperm and egg cells. Okay. That will combine to form a new organism. Okay. Both important, but for totally different reasons. Okay, that makes sense. But our source material also mentions that meiosis can sometimes go wrong. It can. What happens when this carefully choreographed dance gets a little out of step? Well, like any complex process, there's always a chance for error. Uh Sometimes chromosomes don't separate correctly during meiosis. Right. A phenomenon called non-disjunction. Non-disjunction. That sounds ominous. It does. What are the consequences of that happening? It can lead to gametes, those sperm or egg cells, having an incorrect number of chromosomes. Okay. Some might have an extra chromosome while others might be missing one. Okay. And if one of these atypical gametes is involved in fertilization, it can affect the development of the embryo. Okay. So a missing or extra chromosome can really throw things off. It can. Our source mentions Down syndrome as one 
outcome of non-disjunction. Right. Can you explain how that happens? Sure. Down syndrome occurs when there's an extra copy of chromosome 21. Okay. A condition called trisomy 21. Okay. Usually this happens because of non-disjunction during meiosis in one of the parents. So instead of the usual two copies of chromosome 21, there are three. That's right. What kind of impact does that have? Trisomy 21 leads to a variety of developmental and health-related challenges. Okay. These can include characteristic facial features, intellectual disabilities, and an increased risk of certain health conditions. It's amazing how one extra chromosome can have such wide-ranging effects. It is. It really highlights how delicate the balance of our genetic material is. Yeah. And while there's no way to prevent non-disjunction altogether, okay. there are factors that can increase the risk. What kind of factors? One significant factor is the age of the parents, especially the mother. Okay. As women age, the risk of non-disjunction during meiosis increases. So older parents have a higher chance of having a child with Down syndrome. That's right. But it's important to remember that it's still a relatively rare occurrence. Okay. Even in older parents. And there are prenatal tests like amniocentesis right. that can detect chromosomal abnormalities like trisomy 21 early in pregnancy. Right. Those tests can provide crucial information for parents as they make important decisions. They can. So we've seen how meiosis can create incredible diversity. Yes. But also how it can sometimes go awry. Right. It's like a powerful force with both amazing potential and potential risks. Exactly. And that leads us to a bigger question. Now that we understand the complexities of meiosis, how do we grapple with the ethical implications of this knowledge? Ooh, that's a big one. Stay tuned, listeners, because in the final part of our deep dive, we'll explore those ethical considerations and try to wrap our heads around this powerful process that shapes life as we know it. Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Yes. We've been unpacking meiosis. Right. The incredible process that shuffles genes mm -hmm. and creates the sperm and egg cells that make you, well, you. We've seen how this intricate cellular dance oh, yeah. leads to the amazing diversity within species, ensuring huh. that no two individuals are exactly alike. Right. Identical twins are like nature's little cheat code. Okay. Bypassing all that genetic mixing. Yeah. But for the rest of us, meiosis is the reason why we're all unique, each with our own special blend of traits from mom and dad. It's like each of us is a one-of-a-kind work of art yeah. created by this random mixing and matching of genetic material. And it's not just about creating variety for its own sake. That's what I was thinking. What's the point of all this shuffling? Why is genetic diversity so important? Well, imagine a world where everyone was genetically identical. Okay. If a new disease came along, it could wipe out the entire population because everyone would be equally susceptible. Oh, wow. I see what you mean. It's like putting all your eggs in one basket, genetically speaking. Exactly. But with genetic diversity, some individuals might have variations in their genes that make them more resistant to certain diseases. Yeah. They would be more likely to survive and pass on those resistant genes, helping the species as a whole adapt and thrive. So meiosis isn't just creating individual differences. It's actually safeguarding the future of entire species. It is. It's like a built-in insurance policy for life on Earth. That's a great way to put it. And this process, this constant shuffling and reshuffling of genes over generations is what drives evolution. Okay. It allows populations to adapt to changing environments right. from climate shifts to new predators and everything in between. It's mind blowing to think that something happening at a microscopic level inside ourselves can have such a profound impact on the grand scheme of evolution. It really highlights the interconnectedness of life. But as we learned in the last part, this amazing process isn't foolproof. Yeah. Sometimes errors happen. Right. Like non-disjunction, which can lead to conditions like Down syndrome. Right. Those errors are a reminder that even the most intricate and elegant biological systems can sometimes go awry. They can. And as we learn more about these systems, we're faced with more and more ethical questions. Exactly. For example, with prenatal testing, we can now detect certain genetic conditions early in pregnancy. Right. This knowledge gives parents more choices, but it also raises complex questions about what those choices should be. It's like we're gaining this incredible power to understand and potentially even manipulate our own genetic makeup. But with great power comes great responsibility, right? Absolutely. And that's why it's so important to have open and honest conversations about these issues. We need to think critically about the potential benefits and risks of genetic technologies and ensure they're used ethically and responsibly. So listeners, as we wrap up our deep dive into meiosis, we leave you with a final thought to ponder. Okay. 
meiosis. This remarkable process happening inside each of us is responsible for the incredible diversity of life on Earth. It is. It drives evolution, ensures the continuation of species, and ultimately makes each of us unique. It's a powerful reminder of the intricate beauty of life and responsibility we have to understand and safeguard the delicate balance of our genetic world.